from an observational perspective, if we want to understand how galaxies form and evolve, we actually need to find them. We need to hunt from them. And in practice, what we need to do is to try to find redshifted lines so that we know how far away that galaxy is, and then we can actually study them. Now, typically the features or signatures that we're looking for have been caused directly or indirectly by O-class stars. The reason for this is because O-class stars are the brightest or the most luminous, and they lead to the easiest signatures to find. But on top of that, the presence of O-class stars imply that the galaxy is active. It's still forming stars, and also some of the signatures of O-class stars can also be mimicked by supermassive black holes. Here at Lancaster, one of the techniques that we use is to actually build filters that are only sensitive to light at specific wavelengths, and then putting them on top of telescopes like the INT or the Subaru telescope to actually map the universe and try to look for redshifted Lyman alpha emission. And if you recall section five, when we look at the hydrogen atom, Lyman alpha as a rest frame wavelength of 1216. So if it redshifts to something like 4,000 Armstrong, we're looking at redshift about 2.2. If it redshifts all the way to almost 9,000, we're looking at redshifts six and seven. And by serving the universe with all these filters and by finding things with Lyman alpha in them, then we can actually produce 3D maps like this, such as our Lancaster slicing cosmos in 4K with 4,000 Lyman alpha emitters. Looking for distant sources can also be done with broader filters and also looking at continuum features. And this is particularly useful if we're looking at some of the highest, most distant sources. Now it turns out if we look far enough into the past, then most of the universe was actually in the form of neutral hydrogen. While nowadays around galaxies, hydrogen is mostly ionized. What happens if you have a lot of neutral hydrogen around very distant sources is that neutral hydrogen will typically be in n equals one or their electrons will be at n equals one. And that means that if those atoms receive a wavelength of Lyman alpha or something higher, they will very easily get excited. And by becoming excited, that light disappears from our line of sight. And this means that for very distant sources, there's a very clear step in the continuum of a bright source, where essentially here, all the clouds of hydrogen in the line of sight are absorbing the photons. And then once we reach the wavelengths that are redder, then the Lyman alpha, then all the continuum gets true. And the practicality of using this, which is called the Lyman break, is that if you just develop a broadband filter that captures, say, this side of the spectrum and another one that captures this side of the spectrum, then you can actually compare both. And on this side, you will see nothing or very, very faint emission. And here it becomes very bright. And this is how, for example, people find the most distant quasars or the most distant supermassive black holes. These quasars are now found routinely up to redshifts of seven or even higher. And these discoveries have been really impressive, but perhaps even unexpected, especially because when we study these supermassive black holes, even though we're looking at the universe when it was only less than 1 billion years old, some of these black holes have masses of something like 3 billion solar masses. The black hole in the center of our galaxy after almost 14 billion years, contains something like four times 10 to the six. Yet the beginning, almost at the beginning of the universe, there were supermassive black holes that were a thousand times more massive. And also, even at the beginning of the universe where we expect chemistry to be very poor, there's not a lot of time for stars to produce the elements. At least around these supermassive black holes, we can see all the kinds of elements that are typical in the sun. And therefore, at least in the accretion disks, the supermassive black holes, then chemistry is already incredibly rich. After the CMB, the universe became fully neutral. We can see evidence of that from the CMB, but at some point, essentially around 13 billion years or a little bit more, the universe actually changed, it transitioned from being fully neutral to fully ionized. And this refers to specifically hydrogen atoms outside galaxies. Understanding this last major phase transition of the universe from neutral to ionized is actually one of the big unsolved problems in astrophysics. We understand the ingredients and the things that we require. For example, to ionize hydrogen, 
we know that we need energies in excess of 13.6 electron volts. That's well into the ultraviolet, something like 9, 12 Armstrongs or shorter wavelengths. And we know that massive stars, but also supermassive black holes can actually produce that sort of radiation. However, it isn't clear exactly which sources actually contribute to reionization and also how long it actually took. And therefore, this is one of the most active areas currently in astrophysics. And the big contenders are all explained here. Perhaps some of the first galaxies like CR7, and we know that CR7 was a key contributor and it actually had what we call an ionized bubble around it, but perhaps stars and especially stars that were formed in binary systems and also supermassive black holes likely played a role. And the next few years will certainly unveil more of this relative contribution. One of the potential contributors for reionization, at least in the first stages, were the very first sources of light, the first stars. We call these stars also population three or pop three. And by definition, these first stars should have no heavy elements at all. They should be made purely of Big Bang material. Of course, if you're trying to make a star just out of Big Bang material, there's a lot of challenges. Most stars will form and the cloud will collapse and become cool enough because you have enough heavy elements to actually radiate and provide the cooling of the cloud for you. If you only have hydrogen and helium, essentially, there are very limited ways that you can lose energy and you can only get down to something like a thousand Kelvin. If you go back to section nine and you look at the expression for the genes mass, you will realize that if your minimum temperature when you're forming stars is a thousand Kelvin and, and not like 10, 20, 30 Kelvin, then the gas mass that you require for it to collapse is way, way larger. And this is one of the reasons why we expect first generation stars to have been very massive. On top of that, because these first generation stars did not contain any carbon, nitrogen or oxygen, we actually expect that any very massive first generation star should be stable and should be powered by the PP chain. They will cover further in physics 264. Now, because these stars could have had something like 100 to 1000 solar masses, there's big consequences. On one hand, they should have been very big. So you can see this would be a typical first generation star versus a typical star right now or comparing it to the sun but also because of its huge mass and the scaling between luminosity and mass, we expect it to be way, way more luminous than even the most luminous O-class star. And at the same time, we expect its surface temperature to be up to something like 100,000 Kelvin. And at those temperatures, you can even doubly ionize helium very effectively. And therefore, we expect that if we look at the gas around these stars, we could see the signatures of not only hydrogen being ionized, but even helium being doubly ionized. In other words, we expect that if we were looking at a spectrum of a population three, and remember population three means first generation star, because they're so blue and luminous, we expect them to have something that is peaking all the way into the ultraviolet. And on top of the black body continuum, we actually expect to find emission lines, not only of hydrogen, for example, the Bauman series, but also lines of doubly ionized helium and singly ionized helium. And for years, these have been the predictions for what the spectrum of a galaxy with population three stars would be. Now, of course, because these first generation stars, they literally invented or created chemistry. They're sort of the reason why we're here, and we definitely want to try to find them. They are very hard to find because with such large masses, at least those that would lead to these kind of signatures, they should live for a very short amount of time. And therefore we'd need to be really lucky to actually find them. In 2015, we thought that perhaps we were seeing the signatures of first generation stars for the very first time. This was when we discovered the galaxy that we named Cosmos Redshift 7. So this is the galaxy that I discovered together with Jörg Mati. Sergei Santos and Benham Darvish, all of them now graduated and with their own PhDs. And this was an incredibly luminous galaxy. It's still the brightest galaxy in the early universe, but on top of being incredibly luminous, and we discovered by looking at redshifted laminal emission, the spectrum 
also revealed the presence of doubly ionized helium and essentially fulfilled all the predictions from what we would expect from population three stars being present in the galaxy somewhere in between these two different components. Now, since then, a lot of papers have been written. The paper has been cited almost 300 times and 30 different papers have been written looking at the source and actually arguing for and against it being population three stars, being even the most exotic kind of black hole that you can get when a black hole forms without ever forming a star. So it's something that people call a direct collapse black hole. But with the research that we've been doing over the last few years, we can now tell that the gas within the galaxy is very low in metals, but it's definitely not pristine. So it is possible that some population three stars still exist in the galaxy, but the light itself is being dominated by population two stars and not population three. Also by observing the galaxy with different telescopes, we were able to produce this artistic impression. And this is the one that's shown almost all the time. This is not a real image. This is the real image and real data with the different three components that we now confirmed independently. But if we had a telescope of say a thousand kilometers in space and pointed at CR7, we would probably start seeing all these details. And we believe that if there are some population three stars or an incredibly exotic supermassive black hole, it may well be somewhere in between components A and B. Finally, very recently, by using the ALMA telescope and pointing it at CR7, we're actually able to image the galaxy in sort of three dimensions and discover tiny traces of ionized carbon. By using ionized carbon and actually using the Doppler effect, we can even tell which components are sort of redshifted and which components are being blue shifted. So we can think that this component is essentially closer to us and these two are further away and actually build a 3D map of the galaxy, something that existed 13 billion years ago. But because there's at least traces of carbon everywhere in the galaxy, then the hunt of this pure population three dominated galaxy is definitely still on. So this is it for section 14, where we had a look at some of the tools, the important tools that you need to understand how galaxies form and evolve. Most of it relies on the knowledge that we covered in sections eight and nine. So if you're not so familiar with those tools, I would advise you to go back and recap a little bit or send me questions if you have. And then apart from the tools, we started looking at the very first stages of the universe, how some of the first galaxies formed, the epoch of reionization, how we can find distant galaxies, and also as an example of a major discovery and what it means, I also told you a little bit about CR7, but if you have more questions, please just get in touch. And as always, in the lecture notes, you will find lots of questions at the end that I would recommend you attempt. And once you do that, then you will be ready for the other part of galaxy formation and evolution, which is section 14, where we're going to be looking at the last 13 billion years and looking more into the details of the physics that drive galaxy formation and evolution. So I'll see you for section 14.